Stay tuned after the video for an excerpt from this month's criminally listed podcast, available exclusively at patreon.com slash criminally listed. Number three, James Robert Jones. On the night of August 28, 1974, 20 year old James Robert Jones, a private in the Army, left Fort Dix near Trenton, New Jersey, where he was stationed, to go to a nearby bar with two other privates. After having a few drinks, the trio was walking back to the bays, and along the way, they went into a wooded area to smoke some marijuana. As they were smoking, they were approached by 18-year-old Lonnie Eaton and 22-year-old Thomas White, two other privates stationed at the base. Eaton and White said that they were undercover military police and they wanted to confiscate the marijuana. Jones demanded to see their military police ID. Eaton and White said that since they were undercover, they weren't carrying any ID. Suddenly, Jones pulled out his buck knife, which was razor sharp, and he started slashing at the two men. Eaton was cut six times, and White was slashed seven times. Eaton's wounds were much worse than White's, though. One slash to his abdomen caused his intestines to spell out. Jones and the two other privates ran from the scene and left Eden and White to die. Amazingly, White was able to get help and he survived. Eden wasn't as lucky. He died because of his wounds. The local newspaper called the killer the Fort Dick Slasher. Shortly after the murder, Jones was sent back to his home in Ontario, California. It wasn't long before he was arrested there for the attack. Several people at Fort Dix said that Jones had talked about slashing the two men. Jones was interviewed by the military police and he confessed. In 1974, he was sentenced to 23 years in prison and he was sent to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. Fort Leavenworth was called the castle because of its high walls and towers. Escapes were known to happen, but convicts never stayed on the lam for very long. On March 21st, 1977, about three years into his sentence, Jones was seen working in the dining hall at about 3.30 p.m. When the guards did a head count an hour and a half later, Jones was missing. The next day, he still hadn't been found. At first, the prison officials didn't think that Jones made it outside the walls of the prison. He did though, and how he did it was never revealed publicly. However, he most likely hid in a laundry truck or a garbage truck. Decades would go by, and no trace of Jones was found. If he got in contact with his friends and family, The army was not aware of it. Then in January 2014, nearly 37 years after he escaped, the army learned that Jones may be living in Florida. They got in contact with the U.S. Marshal Service and asked for assistance. The marshals used facial recognition software to compare Jones' army photo from the mid-1970s to a database of photographs on Florida driver's license. Amazingly, they got a match. The license was first issued in 1981 to a man named Bruce Keith who lived in Deerfield, Florida. On March 13, 2014, U.S. Marshals went to Bruce Keith's home. He was arrested and the first thing he said was, I knew this would catch up with me someday. As he was being fingerprinted, he admitted that he was James Robert Jones. He explained that after he broke out of prison, he made his way to Florida. He got married and he worked as an air conditioner repairman. His wife said she had no idea that he was an escaped convict who was serving time for murder. The couple's friends and neighbors said that Jones was a nice guy and they would have never have guessed that he was harboring such a dark secret. When Jones escaped from prison, he was 26 years old 
and he spent 37 years on the lam. At least 33 of those years, he used the alias Bruce Keith. That means he was Bruce Keith longer than he was James Robert Jones. After his arrest, when investigators used his real name when trying to get his attention, he wouldn't respond because he was so used to being Bruce Keith. Jones, who was 59 years old when he was recaptured, was sent back to Fort Leavenworth to serve out the rest of his sentence, and he may still get more years added on for the escape. Number 2. Leonard Fristo. In 1920, 28-year-old Leonard Fristo and an accomplice broke into a livestock company in Deeth, Nevada. They stole two rifles, several boxes of cartridges, a box of salted meat, and then they fled in one of the company's Model Ts. As they were fleeing the scene, a sheriff's posse started chasing after them. Fristo fired several shots at the posse, and two deputies were killed. Frizzo was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. He was incarcerated at the Nevada State Prison in Carson City. On December 15, 1923, about two and a half years into his sentence, Frizzo performed one of the easiest and least daring prison escapes ever. The warden of the prison took Frizzo and another prisoner on a business excursion outside of the prison. The warden left Frizzto and the other prisoner alone in the car. When he did, they simply drove off with the car. The warden said he did not understand why they took off and he expected them to return to the prison at any time. The warden was wrong because Frizzto didn't return. Over four and a half decades would pass before the authorities would learn Fristo's whereabouts. On November 15, 1969, the police were called to a trailer park in Compton, California. A man and his wife were having a problem with his 77-year-old father, Claude R. Willis. Willis had suffered a stroke about 18 months earlier and he was forced to move into the trailer with his son and his family. The elderly man hated living in the trailer. An officer arrived at the trailer and without being confronted, Willis made a shocking confession. He said that he was really Leonard Fristo. He explained that he killed two sheriff's deputies in 1920 and he escaped from prison in Nevada 45 years and 11 months earlier. The police in Compton checked with the Nevada authorities and they confirmed Fristo's story. Fristo said that during his time on the lam, he traveled from coast to coast. He had also lived in Mexico and Canada. In 1927, he married a woman in New York and they had a son. During World War II, he ran a bus line in Maine. He made over a million dollars from his business. He later invested all his money in a cattle ranch in Wyoming. In 1954, there was a crash in the cattle market and Fristo lost everything. His wife eventually died and Fristo was living on social security when he had his stroke. After he was recaptured, he didn't fight his extradition and he was sent back to Nevada State Prison. When he got to the prison, he said, I guess it was just about time I came back. I guess I always knew I'd be back here. Fristo said that he would have turned himself in earlier, but he was terrified they were going to lock him in the hole. The warden at the prison didn't see the point of putting the 77-year-old man in a cell. Instead, Fristo was placed in the prison's hospital. Not long afterward, he was given a pardon and he was released as a free man. He died seven years later in 1977 at the age of 84. Number one, Frank Freshwaters. Around midnight on July 3rd, 1957, 24 year old father of three, Eugene Flint, finished his shift at the Goodyear Tire Plant 
in Akron, Ohio. He drove home and parked his car across the road from his house. His wife saw him park the car and then she started to make some coffee for him. The next thing she heard was a loud crash. She looked outside and saw her husband lying on the road. Eugene had been struck by a car. Sadly, he died because of his wounds. The police determined that the driver, 21-year-old Frank Freshwaters, was speeding when he struck Eugene. He was driving 50 miles per hour and the speed limit was 35. Freshwaters pleaded guilty to second-degree manslaughter. He was given a suspended sentence of 20 years with 5 years parole. That meant no prison time for Freshwaters as long as he followed the terms of his parole. Within six months of his conviction, he violated the terms of his parole several times. The violations included driving a car, getting a driver's license, and not paying $5 a week, which would have gone to the victim's family. A judge ended up sending Freshwaters to prison to serve out his 20-year sentence in February 1959. Freshwaters was sent to the Ohio State Reformatory, which is where the most popular movie about a prison escape was shot, The Shawshank Redemption. Freshwaters was put into medium custody for seven months. He behaved himself, and after those seven months, he was sent to a prison camp that was about 50 miles away from the prison. On September 30th, 1959, not long after being moved to the camp, Freshwaters and another prisoner simply walked away from the camp. After escaping, Freshwaters traveled to Florida and he managed to get a new social security card under the name William Cox. In the early 1960s, he settled in the small town of Hurricane, West Virginia. He moved in with a woman and they raised two sons together. Freshwaters drove trucks for a living, and he was even employed by the state of West Virginia to drive a mobile library from school to school. Freshwaters became a bit of a local legend who was known by his nickname, Cowboy. In late 1975, his common law wife filed charges against him for undisclosed reasons. Sheriff's deputies went to arrest Freshwaters and they found him hiding under a sink in a space that was specifically constructed for someone to hide in. He was taken into the sheriff's office where he was fingerprinted. His fingerprints were seen matched to his warrant for his escape. Freshwaters decided to come clean and he admitted who he was and that he had escaped from prison. The story of the prison escapee being caught after being on the lam for 15 years eventually caught the attention of West Virginia Governor Arch Moore. After the state of Ohio didn't send anyone to two court hearings regarding the extradition, Governor Moore let Freshwaters go. His office said that Freshwaters had been an upstanding member of the community and he didn't seem like he was dangerous. After his brush with the law, Freshwaters continued to live under the name William Cox in West Virginia. During that time, he and his common-law wife separated. After some time, Freshwaters met a new woman named Brenda. They moved to Melbourne, Florida, and Freshwaters got a job as a truck driver. His employers, a couple named Altman, asked him to move into a trailer on their property. They wanted him to care for their marshland and keep trespassers off their land. Freshwaters took the job, and he and Brenda moved into the trailer. After a few years, Freshwaters retired from driving trucks to care for Brenda, who had been diagnosed with cancer. Sadly, Brenda passed away in April 1999. After her death, Freshwaters kept to himself, and he lived alone in the trailer on the Altman's property. Over the years, the trailer became more dilapidated. In 2004, his employer's son, Thad Altman, was elected to the House of Representatives for Florida. 
In 2008, Thad Altman was selected Senator of Florida, and he's still in office today. During that time, Freshwaters, the escaped convict, continued to live on his parents' land. Then in 2015, the U.S. Marshal Service started looking into cold cases in northern Ohio. They found out that Freshwaters was probably living in Melbourne. They tracked him down to the trailer on the governor's parents' property. On May 4, 2015, 55 years, 7 months, and 5 days after he escaped, the local police department in Melbourne knocked on the door of the trailer. They showed Freshwaters his mugshot from when he was first arrested, and he said he hadn't seen that guy in a long time. Freshwaters was extradited to Ohio two weeks later. Ohio had two choices as to what they could do with Freshwaters. They could have given him five years probation or they could have locked him up. There were several problems if they were to send him to prison. Freshwaters was 80 years old when he was arrested and he had arthritis in his hip. He also had no history of violence in the nearly 56 years that he was on the lam. So he wasn't a danger to society. If he were to go to prison, he would just sit around and watch TV while taxpayers pay to house, feed, clothe him, and cover his medical costs. Besides it being a waste of taxpayer money to jail a non-violent elderly man, a lot of people didn't want fresh waters to go to prison. After the newspaper, Florida Today, published a story about Freshwater's life on the lam, the parole board in Ohio received over 2,000 letters from half a dozen states asking for them to release Freshwaters. Raymond Flint, who is the son of the man that Freshwaters killed, was asked what he thought should happen to Freshwaters. At first, Raymond, who was three when his father was killed, said that Freshwaters was just an old man and imprisoning him would be a waste of taxpayer money. However, when he was asked the same question months later, he said that Freshwaters should die in prison. In the end, the parole board decided to grant Freshwaters parole and he was released from prison. The recapture of Freshwaters, who was on the lam for nearly 56 years, was the longest successful manhunt in U.S. Marshals history. Thanks for watching, and now here's an excerpt from this month's podcast entitled Three Cases Too Extreme for YouTube. For more information on the podcast, please visit patreon.com slash criminally listed. Number three, Kevin Davis. Just before 10 a.m. on March 28, 2014, a couple in Corpus Christi, Texas let their dog out of their home to run around in their yard. Not long after they did, their doorbell rang. They opened the door and a young man was standing there. He asked them to call the police because he had killed someone. The woman went and grabbed a phone. She came back to the doorway and called 911. As she was on the phone with the dispatcher, she asked the young man who he had killed. He said that he killed his mother. She then asked how he did it. He said that he beat her to death with a hammer. Finally, she asked him why he did it. He simply said, lots of reasons, and left it at that. The police arrived and arrested the young man, who they identified as 18-year-old Kevin Davis. Davis gave them his address, and the police drove over to his apartment. They found the door locked, but they managed to get a key, and they let themselves in the apartment. In one of the bedrooms, they found the nude body of Davis's 50-year-old mother, Kimberly Hill. Davis was brought in for questioning, and he was very honest and blunt about what he did. His confession matched closely with the autopsy report so the police knew he was telling the truth. What he did was absolutely horrifying. For more information on the podcast, please visit patreon.com slash criminally listed or click on the link on the screen now. 
Thanks for watching and don't forget to visit criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases and browse our web store. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.